This is the intro video for the introduction to the oscilloscope and the RC time constant experiment. The first thing that you're going to do in part A is set up the oscilloscope. They first have you press the menu button for channel 1 and adjust your settings, and then you'll press the trigger menu button and again adjust your settings. After you've done that, then you're going to set up your circuit. So for this circuit, you're going to use the Xantrex power supply. So turn that on. Remember to have the green and the black terminals connected together if you're using the 60-1 model. You want to turn current all the way to maximum, and you're going to set your voltage to 8.5. The resistance that you should be hooking up is 1500 ohms. So you're going to use your decade resistance box. So 1000 plus 500. And then it's just positive terminal to one of these, negative terminal to the other one. Then you'll hook it up to your oscilloscope, and you do have to be careful that the more positive end goes to the red terminal and the negative end goes to the black terminal, just because the oscilloscope will not give you accurate values if you don't have ground plugged into its black terminal. So red to red, and black to black, like this. So when you get your circuit hooked into the oscilloscope, you may or may not see anything on the screen. So go ahead and use that auto set button to get the image on the screen quickly. So the first thing that you'll notice is that this is a straight line, not a wavy line. And that's because the Xantrex is a DC power supply. So it puts out a constant voltage, and that's what we're seeing on the screen. Another thing I want to point out to you is that there's a little arrow on this side of the screen with the number 1 beside it. That marks the location of ground for channel 1. So our voltage was a positive voltage. That means it's somewhere above ground. So that's what we expected. Now the auto set button is not necessarily going to give you the exact values for these settings that they want you to have in the lab manual. So they ask you to change your volts per division to 2 volts. So this number should be 2. So I'll do that now. And of course as soon as I do that, I can't see my signal on the screen anymore. That's okay, we're not done fixing things. They also want you to set your time base setting to 5 milliseconds. So that means that number should be 5 milliseconds. And then the third setting is what's going to allow us to see our signal again. They want you to move this ground position down to the lowest dotted line on the screen. So you just do that with your position knob. You move that arrow along the left hand side right down to the lowest dotted line on the screen. And that now allows us to see our signal again. And the reason why they want you to do this is they were just increasing the size of the signal so that we can get a more accurate voltage value off the screen. So that's what you do next, is you want to calculate what the voltage of the signal is. So count up how many boxes high the signal is, multiply by your voltage scale setting, and then calculate what the voltage of the signal is. And finally for part A, they tell you to change the voltage of your Xantrex up and down and see what it does on the screen. Now in part B, you're using exactly the same circuit as you used in part A. The only thing is you're going to change the power supply. So right now you've got the Xantrex power supply plugged in. You're going to change this to a different power supply that puts out an AC signal. So this is the function generator you're probably going to be using. The on-off switch is here, and if that doesn't work, there's also an on-off switch at the back of the device. First thing you're going to want to do is plug in your BNC connector to channel 1, which is actually the lower one. So like before, you fit it on there and twist it until it clicks. Then you want to set your channel 1 output to on, which just means push this button right beside your BNC so that it's lit up. We're going to want a sine wave for this part of the experiment. Later on we will be changing that to a square wave, but right now we do want it to be a sine wave. And you want to set your frequency to 20 kilohertz. So right now by default it's set to 1 kilohertz, and you'll notice that the 1 is highlighted on the screen. To change which digit is being highlighted, you use these two buttons, so you can move it sideways. But it actually is the one that I want to change, so I'll put the highlighting right on the 1, and then I can dial it up with this knob here. So I'll set that to 20. Next, the manual wants you to confirm that the amplitude is set to 5 volts peak to peak on this signal. So right now, frequency is lit up on the screen, that's triggered by this button, and right beside it is the amplitude tab, so I'll trigger that with this button and confirm that yes, this is set to 5 volts peak to peak right now. Next, you want to confirm that your DC offset is set to 0. So that's the next button, next tab, and yes, it is set to 0. We also want the phase set to 0 degrees, and it is, so I'll go back to the frequency tab. 
and now you're ready to go. So the function generator is now putting out a sine wave at 20 kilohertz. The signal you get may or may not be displayed nicely, so feel free to use the auto set button, and you will probably still want to actually stretch out your scale such that one waveform, one complete up and down oscillation, takes up as much of the screen horizontally as possible. Now the objective in part B is that you want to find the frequency of this waveform in three different ways and compare them to one another. So the first method is that you're going to count up how many boxes horizontally is equal to one complete up and down oscillation of the waveform. Then you multiply that by the time base scale and figure out what the period of this waveform is. And from the period, you could then calculate the frequency. So that's your first value of the frequency. The second frequency is just going to be the one that you set on your function generator. And finally, your third frequency value is just going to be the value that the scope gives you down here. So you compare those three values to see whether they agree well, and remember that the apparatus section of your lab manual lists the uncertainties for the oscilloscope and for the function generator. So part C is where we start doing some real physics. We're going to make an RC circuit, where R stands for resistance and C stands for capacitance. You'll be using a 1000 microfarad capacitor for this part of the experiment. So the first step is that we are going to connect our power supply via a switch to the capacitor. We want our voltage set to 12 volts to begin with, and we want to go from the positive end of the power supply to the switch, and then to the positive end of the capacitor. Now just so you know, you have to be careful with the capacitors to hook them up correctly, because if you hook them in backwards, they explode and spill their guts and make a bad smell and embarrass you in front of your lab instructor. So that would be bad. So just be careful that positive end goes to the positive end of the capacitor and negative end to negative end of the power supply. After you've hooked up the capacitor, then you hook up your resistance. Now the resistance for this circuit is supposed to be 9.9 .9 kilo ohms. So turn that up to 9, turn this one up to 9, double check that everything else has been set to 0, and then also you hook this up to the capacitor, and then from the resistor you go on to your oscilloscope so you can look at this. And just keep positive to positive and negative to negative for the whole circuit. So that's your completed circuit. And what will happen is when you press the tap key down, the capacitor very rapidly charges up to 12 volts. When you release it, then it's going to start discharging. That is, it'll have a voltage stored up and that'll drive the charge carriers through the resistor. However, this guy can't maintain 12 volts indefinitely like our power supply can. So his voltage will decay, which means the current will also decay over time. And we'll be able to watch that on our oscilloscope. So once you've got your circuit hooked up to the oscilloscope, they ask you to again press your menu button for channel 1, double check your settings, press the trigger menu button, double check those settings as well, and then they want you to use your vertical position knob to move the ground line down to this lowest horizontal line. They also ask you to make sure that your vertical scale is set to 2 volts and that your horizontal scale is set to 2.5 seconds, which is actually huge for these sorts of devices. So here I've got it set to 2.5 seconds. As you can see, that trace is moving across the screen extremely slowly. And that's important because when I press down the tap key and then release it, we're going to be able to watch that decay happening in real time. So one thing to notice about this is that when I get to this vertical bar over here, the trace is going to start redrawing itself over here. So there's a gap of about one space. There's also up here a run stop button. So what this does is if I press it, it freezes everything on the screen. If I press it again, it starts redrawing my trace from scratch. So what you'll be doing is you want to press down your tap key, set the trace going, and then release it and watch your decay and we're going to wait until it decays totally, till it's over here, and then press run stop again in order to freeze this image on the screen. So there's my image, and we're going to take data off of this. So the way in which we take data is by using something new on the oscilloscope. Up here at the top, there's a button that says cursor. So you press that, and you want to set your type to time, like that. And this might be a little hard to see, but there's now two vertical lines on the screen. So cursor 1, I can also select cursor 2, and 
when you've got it selected, you can then use this knob to move it back and forth on the screen. So I can move those vertical lines around. So I'm going to put cursor 1 right at the very beginning of my decay curve, so right at 12 volts. Then I'll select cursor 2, and I'm going to move it, using this same knob, to the 10 volt horizontal line, so right about there. Over here, it says delta t equals 2 seconds, so it's actually telling me what the time difference between those two cursor locations are. So we're going to use this to get the data we need for our graph. So our first data point would be 12 volts, t equals 0. Our second data point would then be 10 volts, and the time for it is this 2 seconds. And then I can move the cursor to, to a new location, and again, right here it tells me the time difference between those two. So now I've got 8 volts and this time. So we can use those cursors to get all the data to make our graph. Now the objective of part C is to calculate tau in three different ways. So one of the ways is by getting all of this data, and we're going to make a graph of it later. But the first way in which you're supposed to get tau is to calculate t1 half directly off your screen. t1 half is defined as the time it takes for the voltage to decay to one half of its original value. So if we started at 12 volts, then t1 half is the time it takes to get down to 6 volts. So you can find t1 half as part of your data taking. You could just move your cursor down to the 6 volt line, and then read t1 half directly off your screen. Once you've got t1 half, you can calculate tau, so that'll be your first tau value. You get your second tau value by graphing your data, but you're not going to graph voltage versus time, or that would just give you a curved line again. Instead, you're going to graph the natural logarithm of your voltage versus time. That should give you a straight line graph, and you can determine tau from the slope of the graph. Your third value of tau you're going to get by measuring the resistance and the capacitance. So you've been given a capacitance meter, and using this, you can measure the capacitance directly. You've also been given a digital multimeter, and you can use this to measure the resistance directly. Once you measure R and C directly with the meters, then you can calculate your third value of tau, and then you should compare all three of your tau values to each other to see whether they agree within their limits of uncertainty. Now in part D, we're building an RC circuit again with the same resistance, but a much smaller capacitance. And the problem with this circuit is that it decays so quickly that we can't really have a human controlling it with the tap key. We're just not fast enough. So we're going to have to do something different. So what we're going to do is instead of using the Xantrex, which only puts out a DC voltage, we're instead going to use the function generator. And we're going to set it up to give us a square wave that goes from 0 volts to 10 volts. And basically what we're doing is we're going to use this as our tap key, is it's going to turn the voltage on and off for us very rapidly. So it's a good idea, before you build your circuit, to hook up the function generator directly to your oscilloscope, and watch what happens on the screen as you make the following adjustments to your signal. So the settings you use will be as follows. First of all, you're going to want a square wave now. So change that to setting, and you want to set your frequency to 5 hertz. So I'm going to go over to the 1 hertz column and dial this up to a 5, and then I'll go back to the 2, and dial that down to a zero, and to make it look nice, I'll move things over. So now it is set to five hertz, and then you want to change the amplitude from five volts up to 10 volts. So you go to the amplitude tab, and you just dial this up to 10 volts. However, we don't actually want the default 10 volt signal that's going to come out of this, because right now, it's putting out a signal that starts at minus five volts and goes up to plus five volts. So that's 10 volts peak to peak, but what we actually want is a signal that starts at 0 volts and goes up to 10 volts. So that means we need to add a DC offset to shift the signal upwards so that it starts at 0 volts instead of at minus 5 volts. So we go to the DC offset tab and we're going to change this to 5 volts. We also want to confirm that the duty cycle is set to 50%, which it is, and the phase is set to 0 degrees, which it is. And now this is the signal that you want to use. So here's what my function generator plugged directly into the oscilloscope looks like, and I have already pressed auto set to get things set up, but as you can see, things aren't quite right. This trace is not stable. The reason why is that the trigger level is still at zero volts, and I've set up my signal to be from zero to 10 volts. So the oscilloscope's not being triggered correctly. So you just need to raise your trigger level a little bit, and then it'll settle down. 
Now the manual specifies that you should change channel 1 scale to 2 volts, and also that you should change your time scale to 2.5 milliseconds. Of course, I can't see very much right now, so I'm also going to use the position knob to move everything down the screen a little bit and just line it up on that first dotted line. And now I can see the top of my square wave. And there's one more change that we need to make, and that is that we need to go to the trigger menu and we want to switch from being triggered on the rising slope to being triggered on the falling slope. So now we can hook up our circuit and watch the decay of our next RC circuit. So now let me show you how to set up the circuit itself. So I'll unplug the oscilloscope for now. And following along with the diagram in your lab manual, you'll go from the positive end of the function generator to the resistor, and then from the other end of the resistor to the positive end of your capacitor. And remember to hook up the more positive end to the positive end of your capacitor, or you risk blowing this guy up. And then the negative end of the capacitor goes back to the negative end of the function generator. And that's your basic circuit. And then we're going to hook up the capacitor directly to the oscilloscope. So positive end to positive end and negative end to negative end. And then we should be ready to take data. When you get your circuit hooked up to the oscilloscope, you may find that the screen doesn't quite look the way you want it to, but do not use auto set in this case, because we still want the ground line to be down here, and we still want to be triggered on the falling edge, and auto set will undo both of those. So if you need to fix things, just use the knobs to do that. You'd like your decay curve to be starting over here on this edge of the screen, and one of the easiest ways to do that is actually to adjust your trigger level. So you can see I can move it back and forth that way. So once you're happy with how it looks, they actually tell you to change your time base setting so that you can see a couple different oscillations on the screen at the same time. So something like that. Then they ask you to sketch this. Now in the sciences, a sketch doesn't mean a quasi-artistic squiggle that kind of looks like this. It means this exact image recorded in your notebook. So you can get a piece of graph paper and one box on the screen equals one box on your graph paper and you would draw exactly this shape to scale on the graph paper and label your axes. Alternately, if you've got a flash drive, you can plug it in here and save a screen capture of this image. Ask your lab instructor for help doing that. And another way to do it, which is actually quite easy, is if you've got a smartphone, you can photograph this screen in a high enough resolution that it can be read, and then later print out that image and include it in your notebook. After you've done that, you can stretch things out again. And we're going to use the cursors again to get some data off of this. So you press cursor, and you set your type to time again. And we want to get T1 half directly off the screen here. So cursor 1, I'm going to put it right at the edge of the decay curve. So that's right at 10 volts. And then T1 half is defined as the time it takes to get to half that value, which means I want my second cursor to be on the 5 volt line. So I would adjust that to 5 volts. And once you've done that, you'll be able to read T1 half directly off your screen. Once you've got T1 half, you're going to calculate a tau value from it. Then they ask you to go back to your function generator and change the square wave that you're sending to your circuit. They want you to change it to an 8 volt signal. So you'd go back to the function generator, change both the amplitude and the DC offset in order to send an 8 volt signal to your circuit. And then you're going to again get T1 half directly off of your oscilloscope for it. So you change the signal, look at the new decay curve, get T1 half from it again, and calculate tau from that. And then you're going to compare the tau values you got for the 8 volt signal to the ones you got for this 10 volt signal, and see whether or not they've changed. And think about that for a second. Should they have changed? It's the same resistance and the same capacitor, but a different voltage. You can probably answer this based on what you know of the theory, but you're going to confirm it experimentally. And again, for your third value of tau, you're going to measure R and C directly using the two meters that you've been given. And then compare the tau value that you calculate from R and C to the two other values you have.